Old Man Juan bout to yell some kids off his lawn. A little thought experiment for you here. What if we took the BlackBerry Key 1, uh, packed in a more powerful chipset, increased the RAM, increased the storage, refined the build quality, uh, made the keys larger without impacting screen size, and uh, somehow managed to keep battery life pretty close to what this thing can do? Well, according to reviewers last year, those were exactly the issues facing BlackBerry's return to hardware with partner TCL, and those are exactly exactly the issues addressed with this year's BlackBerry Key 2, so this should be an obvious hit. We should have a hit on our hands for fans of productivity and communication-focused devices. Right? Here's what I've been trying to do, really reviewing this device based on its merits and not defaulting to some kind of cynical conversation about this just being a nostalgic cash grab. BlackBerry is making a claim about what a smartphone can be today. And it's a pretty unique claim when weighed against pretty much the entirety of the rest of the smartphone industry. So let's try and evaluate this phone based on BlackBerry's claims. Starting off with design, Damn, I love holding a phone that feels like it was built for grown-ups. I really like the feel of this phone. And it's one of the only devices I've reviewed this year which feels a lot more complete in build and materials that I don't need to put a case on it just to leave the house. Recalling the metal edges and the grippy back of a phone like the Note 4, squaring off the edges like the Lumia 930, and adopting the silver and black look of a Passport SE or some of the Porsche design blackberries of years past. Pardon the casual swearing, but it's a damn fine looking phone and just really refreshing to hold something that's not made out of glass. And it's such a small element to bring up in a review, but I'm really happy to see that TCL seems to be getting the memo on where we should put buttons on a phone. The volume rocker, the power button, and the convenience key all stacked up on the same side of the device. No more funky power button on the opposite corner of the phone. We can save that funky power power button placement for future Alcatels. We're living in an age of artificial intelligence as some sort of selling point for phones, so it's nice that the convenience key on the side of this is user definable, it's user mappable. You hit this button and it asks you to pick three shortcuts, they're gonna pop up on your screen. In truth, I'm not entirely sure how convenient that actually is though. I wish there were some kind of long button press action. I mean, the entire rest of the keyboard can be programmed for a short press and a long press. I kinda wish the convenience key worked the same way. Oh, and we're going to talk about the keyboard for a bit because it's a nice little bit of Time Lord engineering. We managed to make these keys significantly larger without changing the overall form factor of the phone from the key one. The larger individual keys are nice, but I think one of the nicer improvements, at least from my perspective from typing on this phone for the last couple weeks, is how much more space there is in between each row of keys. That little bit of extra separation comes in handy. Now, I never really had any issues using the key keyboard on the Key 1 when it was my daily driver phone, but coming through the Key 2 and now going back to the Key 1 just to do some comparisons, that keyboard manages to now feel a bit more cramped than what we're currently using on the Key 2. And there's just something bold about a keyboard stapled to the front face of a modern smartphone. Get it? Bold? There's just no hiding it. It's right there, right in your face. Sure, an all-screen device is going to be nicer, probably a bit more flexible for media and gaming, but the focus of this phone is communication, and when you pop up a software keyboard, that changes your field of view and minimizes how much information is still on your screen. Keeping the keyboard static means those times where you're entering text doesn't change the view of what you're looking at. And I'm not even going to try and claim that I'm somehow faster typing on a hardware keyboard, especially opposite some of the really great software swiping keyboards, but I find the flip side of this is when I'm typing out messages on the key too, I enjoy longer text entry sessions than what I would normally put myself through on software. That tactile feedback, those little clicks under your thumbs goes a long way towards improving a longer message. And let's not overlook one of the main reasons why we're likely to be fans of Android. Supposedly, we like customization, and when every single key on a QWERTY keyboard can deliver some specific shortcut for you, then you really have no better solution for custom tailor fitting 
a phone to your unique usage. This is probably the closest one of us will ever get to having a truly bespoke smartphone. For all of my fanboy gushing on the keyboard, the screen is good, but it's probably not going to turn any heads. Exceedingly similar to the Key 1, but it does behave a little differently on the software on the phone. Uh, manually, it doesn't seem to let you crank the screen as bright as what we could get on the Key 1, but you flip it over into auto brightness, and it seems to push the screen, it seems to drive the screen just a little bit brighter when you're in daylight conditions. Minor changes, to be sure. It's a perfectly functional LCD, especially for what BlackBerry is trying to go for here, and readable in basically all but direct sun conditions, so we're not going for any records. Going for general refinement throughout this entire build, the design of this phone, every little piece of it seems to be touched and enhanced from last year's model, but the real improvements are all under the hood. BlackBerry stepping up a small but significant tier in terms of overall chipset performance, and also addressing pain points from the Key One like increasing RAM and increasing storage, all adding up to a different tier of performance than what we saw from last year's model. And even for sprucing up some of that performance hardware, the overall focus is still on communication and efficiency. If your only metric for a phone is horsepower, then you're not going to be impressed by benchmark numbers that were current two years ago. But if you're coming from a Key One or some other similarly specced mid-ranger, this is gonna be a welcome improvement. I've read numerous complaints about Key Ones slowing down over time. Time. So more RAM and more storage should help prevent or at least reduce that kind of degradation. Going from a Qualcomm 625 to a Qualcomm 660, it's difficult to get a handle on the real world implications of that performance improvement. But we got a couple tests to point to showing off that this is definitely a snappier phone. Over the last year, it's been my hypothesis that Snapdragon 820 level performance is about all you really need for a good high quality daily driver phone. And this phone is reinforcing my hypothesis. The 660 performs very close to those 820 levels. It's a nice step up even when you're working with media, rendering, 4K video, and pushing it with some graphics intense gaming. Now, no one's gonna confuse this for a OnePlus 6, but this phone is hanging in there much better, even after setting all the graphics settings to high quality, the kind of gameplay the Key One just totally couldn't hang with. Network and radio performance seem to be holding in place from last year's phone. I can get almost the full bandwidth of my cable connection over my mesh Wi-Fi. And around town, in my very unscientific testing, I seem to be getting slightly better LTE reception on average. Okay, shifting over to software, BlackBerry is making an argument for their services running on top of Android as a value add proposition. Google's operating system forms the backbone of this phone, but they still want you to think of this as a BlackBerry first and foremost. The general user interface is gonna be familiar enough to the Android faithful. Home screens, notification shade, app drawers, all exactly where you would expect them to be. Only a small handful of little tweaks are going to molest that pure stock Android experience. One such addition, BlackBerry is adding the hub uh, in much the same way that Samsung has added edge panels to a Galaxy. It's a little tab on the side of the phone persistent throughout the UI and the hub collects your calendar info, social media info, your contacts, messages, and puts them in one convenient, easy to read place. In theory, it should help streamline interactions with your gadget, but I just couldn't retrain my brain to think of one big bucket area for all of this type of calendar and contact messaging. Where it might have been a significant benefit in the classic BlackBerry days, a one-stop shop for anything that you might want to do on your phone, I just don't use my phone like that in this modern era. There are already numerous ways to organize and deal with notifications. I'm a creature of habit. So some folks might really like this, but this is going to be a feature I'm going to disable on my Key 2. But BlackBerry's alterations to Android go more than just skin deep. Key 2 claims to be one of, if not the most secure Android device available to consumers. Cryptographic keys unique to each phone, special hardware and verification at the time of manufacturing to prevent tampering. A trusted platform preventing someone from rolling back to a previous build of Android. A hardened kernel which deletes any unnecessary services. The phone is unrootable 
and full disk encryption is available to the user as soon as you put in a PIN or a password. There's a very different philosophy at play here. BlackBerry developers believe they have proactively created a much more secure communications platform than your standard run-of-the-mill Android phone. They believe that means they shouldn't have to jump on every single monthly security patch that comes from Google. According to BlackBerry, you're going to see security patches pushed out to this phone if and when they find threats that will affect their specific hardware. This will certainly rub some consumers the wrong way, that feeling like your phone isn't being well supported by the manufacturer, but it's not necessarily neglect. More, it's just BlackBerry's really confident that they've addressed major security issues up front at the time of manufacturing the device. In my time using the Key 1 and the limited amount of time I've spent with the Key 2, I wouldn't expect a lot of major updates to be pushed to your handset. There's a major focus on security and visually that's best expressed with the DTAC app, guiding users through best practices for managing their personal information. If there are any gaps in your behavior and your security protocols, you're going to be notified about it here. And you also get a full list of apps and what permissions those apps are requesting. If you have files or apps on your phone that are a little bit sensitive, there's a biometric locker that you can hide things in. If you ever have to hand your phone off to a stranger, it's nice knowing they can't just go digging through everything. And something that feels like a gimmick but works way better than it should, Privacy Shade, where it lines up just a very narrow piece of text and then darkens the rest of your screen. Not a bad way to keep any sensitive information on your screen safe from spying eyes. I really thought it was going to be a gimmick, but this is a highly customizable feature and very well implemented. Also, including Firefox Focus is just a nice touch. A browser built around blocking ad trackers and basically deleting your browsing behavior. I've recently migrated to the regular Firefox for Android browser, and it's been a nice change of pace. For any phone, software and hardware synergy are critical. Revisiting the keyboard, because I love this keyboard, just slapping a QWERTY on a device is insufficient. It's not enough to just glue a bunch of buttons to the front face and call it a day. Like the Key 1, this hardware is well implemented throughout the entire phone. Capacitive sensors built into the keycaps allow this to become a giant trackpad. You can scroll through home screens and swipe up through apps. And it's a wonderful addition for the camera app where you can use this hardware to adjust exposure settings and then the space bar also becomes a shutter button. Speaking of the space bar, the fingerprint sensor built into the space bar returns. No insecure face unlock solutions here. Uh, you get fingerprint on the front face and that's about it for biometrics. This is where I would normally complain about the fingerprint sensor location being on the front face and at the bottom edge of the phone. I typically prefer rear mounted fingerprint sensors for how you're supposed to hold your phones but there is an overall focus, a philosophy to using this device, and it's in anchoring your hands around this hardware keyboard, minimizing any additional movements in your hand to get to specific features. So the spacebar fingerprint reader here is very well served and very well considered for what this phone is trying to accomplish. Even into something as simple as text correction, the little options you get while typing out messages to fix your spelling, they're all accessible through swipes up on the keyboard. It's only once you get into special characters and emoji that your text entry options are going to take up more of your screen. Another nice little upgrade, Camera Tech, the first BlackBerry with a dual sensor rear camera setup. If you'd seen any of my previous smartphone or camera reviews, you'd know that zoom sensors are my least favorite implementation of dual sensor hardware. But a zoom sensor does give you a nice little bit of reach. It can be really fun for nailing some macro shots, getting that really pretty depth of field blur in the background, and it also delivers a pretty decent portrait mode considering we don't usually turn to BlackBerry for this type of content creation. Plenty of small gripes, areas where I hope BlackBerry will continue to improve, things like some form of image stabilization. Your 4K videos are gonna be pretty twitchy. But all things considered, especially looking at the target demographic, the people who might be interested in a phone like this, you're actually treated to a fairly competent smartphone shooter. Now, you all know I'm gonna have a lot more to say about the camera performance on the Key 2. My full camera deep dive was not ready to go at the time this review was shot, but once it is published, you're gonna see a little card popping up on your screen now. 
And of course, moving forward, my camera reviews are Patreon exclusives. Patreon.com slash some gadget guy. If you want to get the full scoop, the deep dive and see gigabytes and gigabytes of photo and video samples, I hope you'll check it out. Similar to the camera performance, audio playback has also gotten a little sprucing up. Again, I don't think we look to this label. We look to this brand for multimedia prowess. We're not looking to the key two for the best music, movie, or gaming setup. That being said, speaker and headphone playback quality are improved over the Key 1. In fact, audio performance on the Key 2 is within spitting distance of a phone like the OnePlus 6, which is pretty crazy when you think about the focus of those two different devices. Like the camera tech, we can take a closer look and a closer listen to my audio benchmarks, the charts and graphs that I use to compare different devices, and take a listen to that speaker output, how it might fare against another potentially similarly priced device. And I also have some thoughts on the included earbuds. Patreon dot com slash some gadget guy once again future home for all of my camera and audio deep dives now a major win for the key one was battery life my first weekend with this phone was a three-day hyper-miling tour de force. Moving to the Key 2 and stepping up to a more powerful chipset comes with pros and cons. If I use the Key 2, more like how I used the Key 1. Uh, more limited interactions, uh, majorly focused on just communication, social media, very light multitasking. Under those conditions, the Key 2 seems like it's capable of outperforming the Key 1. Again, thanks to those different in chipset and processor design. But when you have more power on tap, you don't keep using the more powerful phone like the less powerful phone. And more aggressive use means less overall battery life. I don't get two full days of use like I used to on the Key One, but as an example of what this thing can do on one of my Newegg production days, a pretty busy day for me, I pulled the phone off the charger around 5 a.m. in the morning, on one of those days, I typically drive around three hours, about an hour there, two hours back, and I made sure not to plug the phone into my car charger or any of the chargers on set that we might use. I did a full production day's grind on set at Newegg. I kept the phone mostly on LTE while connected to my car stereo, my car computer to track my mileage and having it stream my podcasts, mostly over LTE. When I got home, I had more work to do, but at least then it was connected to Wi-Fi, and when I finally went to bed at around 1.30 in the morning, I still had 38% of the battery left. On high performance flagship phones, we think it's so impressive when a phone lasts into the late evening, but just making it to dinner time or beyond dinner time is insufficient when you really need to hammer your phone on the go. Recharge rates under the normal charging mode are acceptable, but they're not going to drop any jaws. I just haven't been that impressed with Qualcomm's QC3 implementation after using Oppo's and OnePlus's and Huawei's. BlackBerry does include a boost charge, but it's really not that much faster than the standard recharging rate. Normal recharge mode, boosted recharge mode. For how this thing sips juice though, 30 minutes on a charger could mean almost an entire extra day of runtime. Lastly, I do have a couple minor gripes that didn't really fit well into individual segments for this review. A few folks have been complaining that the fingerprint sensor on the Key 2 is a little twitchy than last year's model. For me, it's just kind of a bummer that it seems to be consistently slower. There's just an extra little beat every single time I unlock the phone from what I was used to on last year's BlackBerry. Similarly, when you're using the capacitive keyboard to scroll through apps, it seems every now and then the phone just needs to wake up the keyboard and that first or sometimes second swipe won't be properly registered until you move around on that keyboard just a bit, then it'll kick in and you can go through the phone no problem. That does seem to be dependent on individual services though, because I haven't notice any of that lag when using the capacitive keyboard with the camera app, for example. The haptic motor on this phone is improved over the floppy buzz of the Key 1, but it has a springy boing feel to it, which might be unpleasant to some users. It's not dissimilar from the doink feel that you might get on a OnePlus 6. And BlackBerry, TCL, if you're watching this video, 
please get rid of the capacitive navigation buttons under the screen and above the keyboard for the Key 3. Another area where this hardware has been improved over the Key 1 when you're swiping around on the keyboard, you're less likely to accidentally hit one of these buttons, but it still happens. Honestly, this just seems like the perfect phone to move over to software, on-screen navigation controls that can hide when you don't need them. And finally, to wrap up my list of grievances, all phones should list this, but especially devices with some kind of business focus in mind, we should know exactly what the IP rating for the Key 2 is. I'm not expecting a phone with a hardware keyboard to have a full IP68 rating, but if this is gonna be my travel companion, I at least need to know to what tolerance is this thing rain resistant or splash resistant. Whew, okay, that was a lot of talking. Where does that leave us with the BlackBerry Key 2. What's up with geeks and complaining about pricing these days? Yes, the Key 2 is more expensive than the somewhat pricey Key 1, and a $100 premium ain't nothing to sneeze at. But this isn't just price creep. Everything's been refined and taken up a level, jumping up to a more powerful line of processors, doubling the RAM, doubling the storage, doubling the rear cameras, and addressing numerous fit and finish issues from the first phone. It's worth repeating, the premium you're paying for this device is not in getting the prettiest multimedia hot rod the market has to offer, it's in getting the most robust security platform in the land of Android. In this age of daily news reports on data breaches, law enforcement cracking open other phones and add plugins that track every aspect of your web browsing behavior, this phone is not overpriced. It just might not be focused on what you value in a mobile gadget. I don't know, maybe you just don't care about your security or privacy. The title of this video, obvious clickbait aside, is a sentiment shared by several reviewers. There is no one-size-fits-all, true all-rounder best smartphone. The Key 2 is the best communicator specialist device of 2018, and it handles the fun stuff better than the key one. It's rare that we find a true outlier, a real best in any specific category. That's what makes the key two so special. It really is the best at what it does. As always, thanks so much for watching. I'll of course have some links down below this video where you can find more information on the BlackBerry Key 2, maybe shop one of these puppies online. And uh, around those links, there are numerous other links for how you can support production on this channel, including checking out my Patreon campaign. As mentioned previously in this video, the future home for all of my camera and audio deep dive reviews, behind the scenes, production diaries, and some other fun perks for subscribers on my Patreon. Names are flying by on your screen right now. Those are awesome people who have already started supporting and building a new community over on patreon.com slash some gadget guy. It's becoming a cool little place for like-minded tech fans to hang out, chat about their favorite gadgets, and I hope you'll check it out. Once again, patreon.com slash some gadget guy. Let's build something cool together. I really do appreciate all of the support, not only people watching my videos, liking them, leaving comments on them, but also sharing them on social media and on sites like Reddit. So you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy on the socials, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the Twitters, and I will catch you all on the next review.